one action would you recommend to our listeners um, that would shake up their perspective on climate and food? Uh, be a three-year-old. Ask why. Nobody is paying the cost of the food that's wrecking the Amazon so we can grow some more soybeans so that we can feed our chickens. Let's, let's p price in the cost of killing the Amazon for that chicken. You know, sustainable farming is great. Why aren't more farmers doing it? And talking to them, we understood, you know, it's the money, stupid. The truth is they're actually linked. You know, you can't get away from it. If you don't have a healthy planet, you're not going to have healthy people. It's not just nitrogen that gets into the waterways from farms. Diffuse pollution from farmland is, you know, one of the biggest polluters of our waterways. And we've got nitrogen, you've got all those pesticides that we talked about, you know, killing chemicals, and you've got phosphorus. It's kind of an inevitable consequence if we don't clean up our act. One of the greatest tools that we can do is harness our own frustration because it can lead to solutions to make things better. Hi, I'm Chris Caldwell, and welcome to Season 3 of Conversations on Climate. Kelly, this is an enormous pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us today in the London Business School. Uh, this wonderful room that we've been given in the boardroom, looking at the Reasons Park. A very suitable uh, setting for talking about all things you know, regenerative agriculture. It, it is indeed, and suitable for us to both be sitting here, considering we are both alumni of this wonderful institution. Before we kick in, uh, could we start with a little bit about your career? Like you've had a really kind of interesting and very varied path at this point. So starting out as um, you know biologist and spending ten years on kind of cancer treatments uh, in the, the pharma sector, then little pivot here, here, here and there, food waste and uh, MBA, and uh, now you are a you know agri-tech entrepreneur. Yes, this fit is wonderful. Um, I'm just interested to know how you you made the transition, or what brought the change for, to change in mindset from from really kind of human health into more, more kind of planetary and systemic health. Yeah, well, it certainly was not a planned career. I think as some of the most interesting ones aren't, right? But uh, the north star, I guess you could say, is I just love learning and I kind of hated the idea that I had to con confine myself to one topic. And so, for example, I studied uh, biology, human biology, and East Asian studies, just cause. <laughs> and um, that ended up leading to a career in medical market research in East Asia, first Japan and then China, using my language, uh, getting paid to learn about medicine, which I quite enjoyed, and getting to travel all around this fascinating region, uh, doing the market research, which helped me provide insights to commercialize cancer drugs. So, sounds great. And I, I've realized that I feel like I'm always kind of about five years behind where I should be in my career. And what I mean by that is, by the time I was like really understood market research and able to provide great value and insights, um, I realized that I didn't really care about it anymore. <laughs> I cared about the planet and its health, um, not so much people's health because Living in China brought me face to face on a daily basis with what we were doing to the environment, to the planet, to the climate, with our metabolism as a species. I guess I, I viewed it as a biologist would, humans as a super, super organism, and how we were producing the goods of our daily life, which, you know, in the early oddies, were definitely mostly produced in China. It was the world's factory. I just saw, oh my goodness, the, the products of our metabolism is all this pollution and that just can't last <laughs> if we're going to last. And so um, that's when I realized I wanted to be doing something with my career and my education for the planet, but I, I didn't quite know what. And so now I am doing that, but it took me a while to get there, <laughs> involving a move to the UK, studying at London Business School, um, and then some experience consulting for climate tech firms before I founded my own. Fantastic. And before we kind of go into the big kind of deep dive in there to kind of the macro issues on, um, on, on food and agriculture, <clears throat> um, I'm interested to know kind of whether your work uh, like in this space has impacted your own feelings or relationship with food. 
Massively, absolutely. So uh, we can talk about how I got into the food slash agriculture space, but in terms of the ramifications now, I do what I can to buy organic food, um, food that's grown with as few chemicals as possible, because I now have a decent understanding of what those do to the environment. I uh, try to buy locally um, from domestically produced produce if I can, you know, getting like a veg box from an organic grower. And I try to cook as much as possible because uh, now I understand the ramifications of ultra processed food, which is pretty much most things that you could buy in a box. If it comes in a box, it's probably processed, probably got those ingredients in it. And just one of them, for example, uh, palm oil is decimating the rainforests in Asia just so that we can have this stable shelf ready food. Um, and then the final thing that I really do is try to minimize any kind of food waste whatsoever because now I understand how much energy and resources and time and land it took to grow that food and so to throw it away is such a waste. In addition, to just throw it away means that it's going to landfill where all of that resource then becomes methane, potent greenhouse gas, uh, so I try to compost it instead of you know, just throwing it in the bin. So those are all the different ways. Okay. Massive change. Just a kind of little follow up on that. Um, on the organic side of things, how um, reliable is a label? Can you just, if you see something supermarket says organic on it, can you, do you know that that's going to be significantly better? Or are, are there grades of organic that you should be looking at? So like mm. how, how, do we, how do we know, you know what, what, what we should be picking up, what we shouldn't? Yeah, and I'm not trying to say thou shalt only eat organic. This is a personal preference, and, and there are certainly issues with growing organic food. But organic tends to be a label that takes a lot of uh, effort and time to get certified in. So there has to be a two-year washout period where all the chemicals that you've used before have time to kind of dissipate, leave the system, um, and you have to do certain practices and you aren't allowed to use a number of different products, chemicals. So especially if it has anything that says the soil association on it, you should be able to be confident that it is organic. Um, I, it'd be difficult to speak to other countries or things like that, but yeah, it's, it's a big hurdle to, to get that label. So I think that's why not as much food is grown that way. Um, and it, that me it gives the label meaning. Okay, brilliant. Um, and as a trained scientist, um, going into entrepreneurship wouldn't be the most natural of paths. Like, you know, as a trained scientist, you, more people would tend to go into research or consulting if they, you know, they felt they wanted to be you know, working on the mission. What, what brought you to entrepreneurship and what's your experience been, like particularly interested in the, 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 the startup um, incubator that you were at, which it calls like half Love Island, half Dragon's Den, <laughs> is that right? <laughs> that is exactly right. Uh, yeah, well, I think it all goes back to the fact that, you know, I just, I hate being put in any box. And so I wouldn't necessarily call myself a trained scientist. I would say I studied biology. And in fact, I studied a type of biology at a place that reinforced that. So I studied human biology at Stanford. And what that meant was I studied the, the sciencey bit, you know, like how our bodies work. Well, um, but I also studied the fuzzier stuff that surrounds us humans, our social mores and, and culture and how we build that, how we build our own systems, which is kind of the meta trappings of the human organism that makes us function like we do, because we are, we are not single individuals, right? We are a hive <laughs> of activity globally, right? And, and that's what really interested me. How do we humans act as a super organism? What's our emergent properties of that, our civilization and culture? And so I studied both aspects. So that's why medical market research was a really good fit for me, because I needed to understand the biology, but I also needed to understand the humans who would be prescribing those drugs, right? What makes them tick? What would push them to go with drug A over drug B? And it was that kind of insight that, you know, I honed in that career. And that career, honestly, was always about building the business. I was brought in to be a seller doer, which is a fantastically sexy term, but it meant I was supposed to go out and bring in the business and then execute the studies. So 
I, I cut my teeth in my career on business development. Okay. And the, 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 the startup? Yes, yeah, so the startup. Yeah, I think that as somebody who was kind of almost like building a startup within an existing organization, building a business unit within a larger company, um, I guess that entrepreneurial spirit um, always was with me, intrigued me. And of course, I you know, went to university in Silicon Valley at the time when all of these startups were just emerging, you know, the, the internet was a thing. Yes, I am, I am that old. And um, so I think that there was an element of admiring that, that drive to create something new of value. Uh, and I just also saw that if we need new solutions, it usually doesn't come from the existing companies, right? It comes from some upstart startup that, that has a brand new way of doing things that disrupts things. So uh, I think that I was naturally drawn to that. And then it was just a matter of figuring out that I think I'm a much better employer than employee. <laughs> <laughs> My skill set um, is lent better to strategy and, and kind of that big picture thinking than it is to, yeah, kind of building more from the ground up. So it was a natural fit that way. But I had to figure that out along the way. Of course. We're delving into an area that we haven't covered yet on this uh, in this series, which is about mm. um, you know agriculture, yeah. and it's it's such a huge topic. I don't think we can ever possibly kind of cover it all. But um, if we could kind of frame it a little bit, and could you give us a little bit on the context of what we're working in, like how what the interactions between agriculture and water and human health, uh, biodiversity? Yeah. Well, like you said, it's a huge topic, so we may need to chunk it. But I think the first thing that I would say is that um, if, if you enjoy eating food, um, which I do, you need a farmer and you are connected to agriculture. And I think in you know, the industrialized world, it's very easy to feel quite distant from our food and how it's produced. But we can't get away from it. And when I decided I wanted to pivot my career to focus on climate, in, instead of pharmaceuticals, the health of the planet, not people. Um, the truth is they're actually linked. You know, you can't get away from it. If you don't have a healthy planet, you're not going to have healthy people. And I learned over this, the course of this journey that the way we are producing our food, which again, we agree we, we need every day, uh, no getting around that, is actually one of the biggest causes of the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis, because the way we grow our food on an industrial scale to feed all these people relies on a whole bunch of chemicals that pollute the air with greenhouse gases um, and the water. And it's also rapaciously, and I use that word um, very consciously, uh, destroying habitats and, and you know, pristine biodiversity, for example, in, in the Amazon or in the jungles of Southeast Asia, just to clear more land to grow our food. Uh, and something's got to give. We can't just keep doing this and think, it'll all be fine. So uh, that is why this is such an important problem that touches every single one of us. There's no getting away from it. Great. And uh, could you talk a little bit about um, the importance of soil? The importance of soil, yeah. Well. It's, it's interesting, there's a really great uh, book by a man named Gabe Brown, a farmer in North Dakota called Dirt to Soil. And it basically blew my mind because I'd never thought of the soil as anything alive. I just thought of it as kind of like that stuff that plants are grown in, that it just holds them there, right? Holds them in place while they do their thing. But uh, I learned, and it made sense from a biological perspective, that the soil is actually when it's healthy, massively alive with all these microbes. And what's going on underneath the ground with a plant and its roots is the world's oldest market. A plant is pulling sunlight you know, through photosynthesis, it's pulling carbon out of the air, creating sugars, and then shooting those sugars down through its roots into the soil and surrounding microbes. And those microbes are taking that carbon and going, oh, thanks, I can't make this myself. Thank you so much and going, hey, maybe you'd like some of these minerals that I just chewed out of this rock that I can eat. And so they do a trade. 
And that's how the plant gets the nutrients that it needs to grow and be healthy and be resilient to any kind of disease. Um, and in exchange for what it does really well, which is shoot down that carbon. And what we've done with our industrial agriculture is we have made our system reliant on these chemicals that kind of give the plant a free lunch, so to speak. It, it puts those nutrients in from the top and the plants respond beautifully, they grow and you get instant results. And that's really great. However, what happens is that that exchange below the soil, uh, the black market, like I call it, 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 it kind of dries up because the plant doesn't need to shoot out that carbon so much anymore and the micros go and, and you know, kind of die and the soil acidifies. And then because it's not getting that natural nutrients from below, then we need more of those chemicals. And those chemicals cause problems. For example, uh, I, I think it's, it's a beautiful law of unintended consequences where we, we solve one problem, but we create another, right? We've figured out how to grow even more food, but that means that that food we grow has less nutrients in it. It goes back to the relationship between soil health and food health and human health. And also, it becomes more vulnerable to pests. And so we have to use other chemicals to kill those pests that want to eat this, you know, rapidly growing plant now. Um, and then that gets in the water and it's just a whole cascading effect of unintended consequences. Yeah, yeah. But that doesn't fit with my understanding and belief of the farmer. Ah. In my experience, the farmer yeah. is deeply cares about land. Yeah. They're, like they're, it, is, it is their heritage, it is their, their, their backbone of their society. Why on earth, if this is true, are farmers poisoning their land and ultimately destroying their, 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 their children, their grandchildren's um, inheritances? It, they, they just don't care. Yeah, okay. I, done. I, I, yeah, yeah, done. <laughs> done. I, I am being incredibly facetious. I think there's an important dynamic to understand that partly explains this, and then there's a bind that they're in that also explains it. The dynamic is, you know, especially post-World War II, there has been pressure to, as, as I think the um, guy in the States, Earl Butts, um, the Secretary of Agriculture said, get bigger, get out. And so there's been pressure to scale. And that has been a global pressure, not just in the US, not just in the UK, and I'm sure not just in Ireland, it's, it's global. Um, and so farmers have been, you know, pushed to buy more land, to increase their production, and also to specialize. So, you, you know, when we think of a farm, we think of, oh, a nice barn and a few cows and some pigs and some chickens and maybe some corn or you know, whatever, um, you know, wheat, if you're in the UK. However, the fact is, is that now most agricultural production is of a certain type, arable, growing grains and cereals, or livestock, growing cattle, sheep, what have you, or dairy, just milk cows for the most part. And so that is one of the big problems that um, we face now, because if you take a small area of land and you put a whole bunch of cows because they need to scale, then that's a lot of nutrients going into one small area, and the land genuinely just can't handle that, that amount of loading. Or if you have an area that's only growing arable crops, let's say wheat, you need all the chemicals to grow that crop and protect it from all the things that just love to eat wheat. And they'll all come there because it's wheat central. As far as I can see, it's just wheat, right? And so that creates those problems there. Um, we've lost that mixed system. So that's, that's one of the things. And a lot of farms had to sell up maybe to big ag, ag, agribusinesses. So it's not just a whole bunch of little independent family farms anymore either. And if you're in big agribusiness, that business, a corporation, doesn't have the connection to the land that you or I, if we owned it and farmed it for generations, would. So that is a big part of the problem. And then the second is the farmers, let's say they do own their own land, and it is a smaller farm. Well, they still are part of the system. There's that pressure to specialize, to maximize production because the cost, they can't command price. They're takers on price. 
and they can't control the costs. They're takers on the agricultural inputs that they rely on to get their production, and their whole incentive is to maximize yield. So there's not a lot that they can really do within those boundaries to, you know, they have to do whatever they can to stay in business. They are businesses. And so it's not that they don't care, it's just that at the end of the day, if it's, you know, between trying to protect that river or make sure that their crop doesn't fail this year and their business doesn't go under, they're probably going to do the thing that makes sure that they're still around next year. Yeah. And uh, part of the yeah, discussed solution to all this is uh, regenerative agriculture. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about the idea of regenerative agriculture and whether you can see it as being a kind of a viable path in the future? Yeah. Uh, regenerative agriculture, you can call it a lot of things. Call it sustainable agriculture. You can call it just, you know, nature savvy agriculture. The idea, the principle, is to work as much as possible with nature to find solutions as opposed to immediately resorting to a can of something to solve your problem, which probably means you'll need another can of something else later to solve that problem it created. Uh, so a great example of this would be integrated pest management. I'll give a very UK specific example. Uh, a crop that has been grown here um, until a lot until recently actually uh, is oilseed rape. Oilseed rape is very vulnerable to the flea beetle. Okay. Um, loves it, just eats its lunch. Um, and so, you know, you would normally use a lot of toxic pesticides, maybe some neonicotinoids, um, which are now banned, um, to, to control this beetle. A regenerative agriculture, you would try to find something that eats the beetle to come in mm -hmm. and take care of its pro that problem rather than simply um, relying on chemicals. You might also do more diversification. So you're not only growing oilseed rape, you've got things in between. So it's not only this big free lunch, right? You've got different things going on. So you're kind of reducing that mono of the monoculture. Um, mimicking nature more. Nature, nature hardly ever grows anything in a monoculture if you think about it, right? If nature is the original diversifier. So um, kind of bringing a bit more of that back into the system as a way to reduce reliance on these chemical inputs and, and, and have a healthier system. And that kind of leads us kind of neatly on to another um, element that we're going to be talking about <laughs> in, <laughs> in, um, in the climate conversations. Yeah. Uh, we tend to really focus in on, on one molecule, which is carbon. We do. Yeah. And it's uh, yeah, largely to, to our own detriments. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, one, another molecule that you're very interested in, you think is very important, is nitrogen. Uh, would you care to tell us a little bit about nitrogen as, a, you know, as, as an element and also why it's important, why, why we should care about it? Absolutely. So nitrogen, the element holding the world's food system hostage, um, it is, you could call it like a limiting reagent in the growth of our food. So plants need it to grow. I mean, every, every, everything needs nitrogen to grow. Funny thing, the air that we breathe is 78% nitrogen. And that stuff just loves it in the air. It is inert. It does not want to move. And just for like, it's 0.04% carbon. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. We're, we're obsessed with it. Yeah. It really has gas effects of it all. But yeah, no, it's, it's quite, it's, it's, it is amazing why, how we don't have this element in our heads far more often. Yeah. Well, yeah, it is, it is the limiting agent, or limiting reagent of, of, say, plant or life growth. Um, it's fixed in the air, so we're surrounded by it, but nary a drop to drink, right? Because it's just stuck there. And really, the way to get it out of the air until, you know, about a hundred and some odd years ago was to have bacteria fix it in, into the soil so that the plants could use it that way. So that, that's how we got it out of the air, was bacteria did the job. And they still do, but uh, some clever guys from Germany uh, named Haber and Bosch came along turn of last century and figured out a way to suck that nitrogen out of the air using a bleep ton of methane, natural gas, methane being a big, um, you know, green, potent greenhouse gas in and of itself, and electricity, which is hugely energy intensive. So they figured out a way to suck it in, out of the air and put it in solid form so that we could throw it on our ground and grow even more food, which sounds great, but again, law of unintended consequences. Turns out all that nitrogen, once they got it in solid form, it wasn't terribly stable. 
it, it still likes to, it wants to go back in the air where it came from, you know, it, it moves. And so it doesn't stay where it was put by the farmer to do that one job of growing the food. Farmers lose about half of what they apply. That's hugely inefficient when you think about it. A farmer is paying a whole lot of money for that nitrogen. It's tied to energy costs, thanks to being made from methane. You can imagine what that's done to the price recently. Um, and you know they, they spend so much money on it, it's one of their biggest costs, and then they lose half of it. It's, it's kind of insane, you know, if, if you lost half of, I don't know, you know, something really important to you, like, you know, half of your house just fell off after you bought it, you wouldn't just go, oh, well, you know, but they, they, they lose it because they can't see the loss. They don't know when it's being lost, how, why, they just know what happens, it moves. And a lot of that nitrogen goes into the water as nitrate, it runs off the farm into the waterways. And uh, nitrate is a carcinogen, kind of going back for cir full circle with my career, causes cancer. So we definitely don't want it in the water. Need to get it out before we drink it. Um, and it goes into the air as two things, ammonia, which is an air pollutant. So the air around farms, especially around the times when they put on the fertilizer can be very bad and toxic. But also, and very importantly for our discussion, nitrous oxide, which is a greenhouse gas 300 times more potent than CO2, 300 times. Mm -hmm. About 1%, let's say, of the gas coming off of the farmer's fields is nitrous oxide, but it has the impact of 300 tons of CO2 for one ton. So it's just crazy that we don't talk about it, um, but again, we can't see it. It doesn't start with C. <laughs> so it kind of doesn't make it into the conversation much. Yeah, yeah. I've seen it written up, well, a couple of kind of stats that you might, might want to comment on. One is mm. um, something like 20% of the world's greenhouse gases come from agriculture. Is that, would that, that be about right? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's definitely debatable numbers, but around a quarter to a fifth, around, somewhere, somewhere, somewhere in there, yeah. There. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so huge and something that we're not really tackling. Yeah. And the other is a slightly trickier one because there's um, a bit more you know, nuance and debate and conversation to be had about it, is that without Haber-Bosch, then we wouldn't be able to feed half of the population of the Earth. Is that true or is that just a... Um, are, they, they, are they they're using facts selectively to, to suit a narrative? Um, mm. I'm not qualified to say how many people we could or couldn't feed if we didn't have Haber-Bosch. What I would say is that because our system is reliant on synthetic fertilizer, and let, just take a step back and, and talk about that reliance. You might think, oh, you need fertilizer to grow crops like wheat, but you know, cows eat grass and you know, dairy, so dairy and livestock, that's fine, they're just eating grass. Well, <laughs> turns out farmers use nitrogen to grow that grass to feed the cows and the sheep. And it, this, this blew my mind when I figured it out. So. Our whole farming system is reliant on this synthetic nitrogen fertilizer for the most part. And we're talking global north and global south. Because of the war in Ukraine recently, there has been a nitrogen shortage. Um, production, a lot of it happened in Russia and in, in Ukraine and getting it out even after it was produced. Bit of a problem recently. It's caused a price spike, also caused actual shortages. And I think it was just a, a little over a month ago in the New York Times, there was a report about how in the global south, people are already starting to feel the effect of not having that nitrogen hit their food supply. Um, so what I'm trying to say is, like the, the fact that we're addicted to this stuff to grow our food right now is real. I couldn't say how many people, if the whole system fell over today, we would be able to feed, but there's no question that we need to reduce our reliance on this stuff if we want to have a livable climate and keep growing food and support this number of people. Now, the, the flip side of that is around a third of the food that we produce now is actually just wasted. Mm -hmm. Going back to my epiphany about food waste. Um, so not only is that a huge waste of all the nitrogen to grow it, you know, the fuel to machines, but it also largely is just thrown into landfill and becomes a greenhouse gas, so that's crazy. So simply by reducing the wastage and distributing better, we could 
you know, get rid of a whole bunch of the nitrogen and still be fine in terms of amount of food to feed people. So I think that it's two things. It's massively reducing wastage and improving distribution coupled with we've got to reduce our reliance because not only are, do we have the greenhouse gas issue, but if we're dependent on this stuff and production falls off, we've got a problem. And it acidifies the soil and makes that soil much drier and deader. So if you've got um, incre increasingly crazy extreme weather, like we have increasingly been having, then those crops are much more likely to fail as well. So the best way to make the food system resilient in the face of all this crazy weather is to make sure that we don't need these chemicals that kill the soil, because we're going to need natural fertility to survive the weather events. But isn't there something more kind of fundamental in the, in the way that we're, we're, we're prioritizing in food? It seems mm -hmm. to be that we're, we're, kind of, we're, we're, we're channeling down into saying we just want to have things as, as cheaply uh -huh. as possible with as little labor as possible. And the way to do this is to be essentially like a, poisoning our soils, um, you know, give, giving, giving all of our food to sugar rush to reduce the costs of, of, pr of producing this. Not sustainable because we're using fossil fuels um, in it, uh, in, in this, this production. It's a diminishing resource, which we need to, we need to be stopping. But on the balance, there's the, the economic side of it. Yeah, and absolutely. And the, the, food, the food property side of it. Is there a way of producing our foods in a more sustainable manner without dramatically increasing the costs? Or is that just inevitable? Are we just like not paying for what we should be paying? With so much employment, it's the... the things are less expensive than they should be because we're not paying for the externalities. Is that, is that, is that fundamentally where I'm, we are with food as well? That's the fundamentally the problem with capitalism. <laughs> in order to have infinite growth, you have to have the externalities because otherwise well, it'd fall over tomorrow. But this is exactly right because the definition of insanity is a policy world where the food that kills the planet to produce is cheap and the food that is grown in a sustainable way is more expensive and therefore commands a premium. Now, mind you, I'm not trying to say that you know, good food isn't worth paying for. What I am trying to say is, is that nobody is paying the cost of the food that's wrecking the Amazon so we can grow some more soybeans so that we can feed our chickens. Can you believe that? We're chopping down the Amazon, which isn't going to come back once we chop it down, to grow soybeans to feed our chicken. I mean, it's is, is just crazy. Uh, so like, let's, let's p price in the cost of killing the Amazon for that chicken. And I can tell you, nobody's going to buy it in the supermarket. It's going to be too expensive. Nobody can afford the Amazon to eat that chicken. And we could even, like, if people still want to buy that Amazon chicken, then that extra money, that premium that was put on it to take into account the externality could then be put back to subsidize the food that was grown sustainably. So they don't have, it doesn't have to command a premium, but the cost of production is subsidized. That would be a rational system. Yeah, 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 okay. But rations in short, short supply these days. Yeah, rationality, yeah. And one of the, um, something that's kind of very kind of close to my own kind of heart and experience mm. is what's happening in Loch Ney in Northern Ireland. Yeah. Know, the, uh, the the largest inland water supply in the UK, 40% um, of Northern Ireland's drinking waters, absolutely poisoned, um, like with, with with toxic algae, in no small part due to you know, farming farming waste and residues pouring into the waters. Uh, yeah, could you would like to to, to to give us a little little, little bit on the the, the, the scientific you know, principles and backgrounds in there and what can be done? Yeah, well, I mean. This is starting to get towards what my company is doing. But the, the fact is, is that it's not just nitrogen that gets into the waterways from farms. Diffuse pollution from farmland is you know, one of the biggest polluters of our waterways. And we've got nitrogen, you've got all those pesticides that we talked about you know, killing chemicals, and you've got phosphorus, which is another part of NPK, the elements needed to grow the food, kind of like the fast food we dump on the food to grow it, right? And most, well, a lot of that washes off, gets in the waterways, and something like a lake, it's, it's going to stay there, right? Um, it's a standing body of water. And phosphorus in fresh water 
causes huge algal blooms that are quite toxic. In fact, I'm going to plug a book that I read that really enjoyed called um, The Devil's Element um, about phosphorus. And I highly recommend anyone who's interested read it. It reads like a true crime novel, but it's true. And uh, it is all, it talks about um, a lake in Florida where they've got a similar situation where these toxic algal blooms, and then that lake overflows um, like a few times a year and goes down, cascading down the waterways, and then the, that pollution reaches all these outlying communities and everything. So it, it's a global problem. And, and I'm sorry that it's affecting you know, your native area, but um, it, it's uh, sadly not surprising. It's, it's kind of an inevitable consequence if we don't clean up our act. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, 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 it is amazing to see this. Like, like Lucknow was the, the heartland of the community yeah. for people. They, they, they swim, they sail, they, they, they walk, they, they fish. They, they, it is a source of immense pride. Now it's literally killing people's dogs. And it's, it's like, it's, it is, it is horrendous. You can't go near it. It, it is, it is toxic. It, it, it's, it's toxic to breed. It smells, it's, it's, it's awful. It, yeah. it is actually, it produces a toxic gas that can kill people. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. People have died falling in this stuff. Like, it, it's insane. So, which brings us along neatly to <laughs> Great Earth. <laughs> uh, would you care to talk a little bit about your business and uh, what's, what, what, what did you do? Sure, well, um, taking a step back, we, uh, my co-founders and I, founded Agreed Earth as a part of the first cohort of a program called Carbon 13, which is a venture builder for the climate crisis, trying to get people together who care about the problem to create businesses to solve it in their own ways. And so we formed with the mission of accelerating the adoption of sustainable farming practices. Don't need to put a label on it, we just wanted all the farmers to start being more sustainable. You know, you can get one farmer and help them become totally sustainable, but we thought it's much better to get all the farmers moving on the journey because what we found is once they get going, they tend to keep going of their own accord. So you just need to get them started and then they'll do their own thing and kind of go, oh wow, I can reduce cost here and this is great. And so that's the mission. And we needed to understand, okay, well, if that, if, if, you know, sustainable farming is great, why aren't more farmers doing it? And talking to them, we understood, you know, it's the money, stupid. They're going to do what they think is in the best financial interest of their business. And if that's using these chemicals to make sure that they can maximize yield and have a crop that keeps their business afloat, well, you know, cost of production, if it makes sense, that's what they probably will do unless incentive structures change. And so when we realized that, we realized there was actually an opportunity to focus on nitrogen. Because as you were just saying, nitrogen costs the farmer to buy, and then they lose, let's say, half of that. But it also costs the people living near that farm that loss. It's hugely costly to them in terms of quality of life, in terms of actual drinking water, uh, air pollution, and increasingly, thanks to policy changes, it's costly to the banks that are helping to finance that farm and the food companies that that farm is supplying because there is uh, both a climate and an ecological cost to that loss. So what we're trying to do is take what is currently an externality, quantify it and geolocate it with satellite data so that a farmer can understand how much they're losing from their fields, from which areas, um, when they're losing it, and then hopefully take decisions to lose less and then use less over time to reduce that reliance. And some of it can just be staunching the bleed, losing less, but some of it can also be rehabilitating the soil in ways that means that they don't need as much anyway because they're kind of drawing that nitrogen down with natural means. Um, to provide that fertility from below. And so that is what we're doing in a way that we can quantify it, and that means we can capture that value, not just for the farmer um, in terms of reducing their, their loss and therefore their costs, but also in ways that they can reap the benefits of improving because they're improving quality of life or, or cost structure for someone else. For example, the water companies. Water companies have to keep the nitrate level below a certain level because, as we talked about, it causes cancer. That's a cost to them. It, it actually takes a lot of energy to um, get the nitrate levels down. 
So if we can re reduce the nitrate coming into the system full stop at source, working with the farmer, then we can reduce the water company's costs. And that actually reduces all of our water bills because they're going to pass on the cost of all of that removal to us consumers, of course. So that is an example of how we can quantify the externality, capture the value, and then feed it back in a way that benefits the farmer, benefits all of us. It seems to have something with um, this will have benefit into our community. Mm -hmm. um, so it kind of feels like something that should be from the the, the, the public purse, the kind of like something that's that governments should be supporting because it's 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 an advisory role to to the farmer, to the um, to to the water company. Um, but like, who who is who is mm. actually your your customer? Like, do you talk to, like do, yeah. who 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 pays the bills? Is the farmer, the water company, the government? Yeah, no, definitely. So one of the first things that we decided is we did not want to sell to farmers. We want to put money back in their pockets um, for doing the right thing, make systems sustainability pay for them, uh, partly because we think that that's absolutely right to do and partly because the B to F business to farmer model is the worst business model ever. It combines the worst of B to B and B to C. So it, it was not going to be the best way to scale a climate tech startup. So for those two reasons, we decided, all right, there are these other parties that benefit from this improvement and they tend to have deeper pockets and they, they, you know, they have a reason to pay for this because it's a cost savings to them. So water companies are our first customer and it really doesn't matter if they're private or public, they still face the same legal requirements um, to, to reduce the nitrates. So it makes sense on a global um, scale. Also banks have to reduce their financed emissions and even just accounting for those is a tough place to start, much less figuring out how to reduce that agriculture is an outsized proportion. There's an example of a bank here in the UK, I won't give the name just in case the numbers are slightly off, but the general idea is farms represent 1% of their books of debt, but that 1% represents 24%, going back to our food production value, 24% of their financed emissions. So mm -hmm. massively outsized. So it's a great place to start. In, and we can work with the banks to help their farmers in a way that is it's helping their customers, right? Stay in business, become more profitable, and it helps the banks reduce their finance emissions. Right. And this is something you're working in the, in the most traditional of sectors. <laughs> But using farming, banking, <laughs> I mean, like. Yeah, yeah. But you're using like you've been you've had some funding from the UK Space Agency. Like this is clearly a like tech, a technology business that you that you're in. But yeah. In the very traditional sector. Um, how do you do you kind of you, you take satellite data and you and and, and then, then what do you do and what's the, and really on a bigger question, what is the potential of data to be um, to be trying to solve some of these these issues in farming and agriculture. Yeah, well, the potential is great, but it's very important because farmers are awash in data. They, they have it coming at them from all different angles. What they really are lacking in is integrated insight. And this is going back to my market research days, but garbage in, garbage out, You what they need is helping understand what is the best thing to do in this context not just a whole bunch of data thrown at them you know, to make their own decision. And so what we're doing with the satellite data is we're taking models of how nitrogen flows through an agricultural system, and then we're making it geospecific based on that particular farms, fields, their elevation, the slope, the soil type, all of those things that matter to how water and therefore nitrogen flow through that system. And then we can really help understand the loss in that specific context, in their specific fields. Show them where they're losing it from, how much and when, um, especially as the you know, they have different rotations through different years and seasons. And that can help them understand, okay, well, you know, if I do this, I lose this much, but if I do this, I lose a whole bunch more, so maybe I just don't do that thing anymore. Um, things like that. Um, so, but the other thing about the technology is this is something that can be done anywhere because satellite data is globally scalable and we need a globally scalable solution to this problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so if let's say your client is a water company, um, how does then that information get passed across to the farmer? Is it, mm. is it from the water company or is it from yourself? What we're doing is we're starting with the water companies doing a catchment area analysis to show them, they, they carry about 
you know, a, a bigger area, a catchment area, and all the different farms in it that are contributing that diffuse pollution into their waterways. So we map that out, quantify the different lost hotspots, show them where they are and how much is coming in from those different sources, and then they can decide, okay, well, you know, we know that there's a few farms in that area. It would be really important to target those farms first because they're probably the 20% of area that's causing 80% of the problem. And the way that they can do that is by providing, through us, a tool that the farmers can then use, see their own fields, and have this better insight as to ways that they could lose less and use less. So the water companies buy our service, SAS model for <laughs> investors out there, <laughs> um, so that they can you know, see the big picture and figure out the best ways to target and um, how, how to have the most impactful mitigation spend in the area, and then provides top farmers a tool that still gives them the autonomy to do what they want to do, but gives them, that arms them with information so that what they want to do is reduce the loss because that's in their interests. So it's a win-win. It's a way to align interests. Mm -hmm. And so we've got kind of a high-tech solution to these problems. There's been a kind of like what we were talking about earlier on about maybe we need to be going back to basics uh, and, and and looking back and uh, there's quite a kind of big push like you know Fakata san in in Japan talking about you know no till natural farming and and and, and the such like um, is there a way for these two things to to coexist like the you know the high high tech high data and the traditional methods absolutely because the high tech is just giving you information to take decisions you could take low tech decisions based on that information it's just a tool right at the end of the day um, and I think that what we'd like to really start doing is crunching the numbers on which of these low tech interventions and, and techniques sustainable techniques work best in which contexts and in which combinations mm -hmm. and this data set hasn't really been crunched yet um, that you know farming is the world's longest outdoor you know, 365, 24 7 experiment, if you think of it that way. And hardly any of that data from all this experimentation has really been crunched. And now we're talking about changing the way we do it again to get off the chemicals and to go back to a more natural way. But as one WAG farmer here in the UK puts it, it's like um, using modern technology and your grandfather's techniques together. Okay. So we'd love to be building that data set to provide that decision support. Brilliant. And uh, you mentioned earlier on that there was some, like the UK seemed to be a kind of attractive place to be doing that. There was some support. Mm. So it's, is, is this a bright spot, something that's regenerative agriculture or something that they, they may be getting um, brighter than most? I think that there is potential. Mm. I think there is hope. I think that it is a very good sign that they didn't just end the cap policy um, BPS with Brexit and then just kind of set up a, a shadow version of that over here. Instead, they said, we're going to take that money that we have been paying as subsidies, and rather than pay it on an area farmed basis, which was before, we're going to give public money for public goods and services, i.e. ecosystem services. So if you put in a pollinator strip, that's worth something to the local environment, to the planet, you know, and so that's worth paying for and subsidizing. And I think that it is one of those things that some farmers still need to wrap their heads around, figure out how it works. Um, and it'll be interesting to see the uptake and it, you know, if there's any unintended consequences of this as well. I'll give you an example. I was talking to a farmer the other day and he was saying, yeah, I think with the new SFI program, you're gonna see a lot more wheat grown here in the UK. Farmers are gonna be giving up other crops and going just to wheat and then some kind of um, cover crop, break crop, and then wheat again. Um, I mean, maybe that's a good thing because it means more of the biodiversity when they're not doing wheat. Who knows? You know, if we end up growing a whole bunch more wheat and then there's some kind of blight that, you know, again, mo like monocropping, who knows? Yeah. It'll be interesting. So why is that a, why would that be an, a, a consequence that they're gunning for? Like, why would they aim for another, a different monocrop? Yeah. Uh, so it's... Again, it goes back to business. Mm -hmm. So if they are um, arable and, and grains are the way they make most of their business, they want to maximize yield. And this kind of cropping system that's subsidized 
it reduces risk for them. It means that they, with the price of wheat staying fairly high, because it's you know one of the global commodities that the world depends on, uh, that they could have a relatively um, secure income from that system, mm -hmm. as opposed to um, trying other things where the price can vary widely, or you have an infestation of some kind of thing and you lose the whole crop, or, or this or that. So that is why it could be just a sure win for them. Okay. And it isn't just trying to um, move land from, um, from, from cattle uh, towards, towards wheat. Hmm. Uh, I don't think it, that the goal would be to move from cattle to wheat per se. Mm. It's, it is a question of would a livestock farmer then start growing wheat? I'd say you'd probably have more chance of a wheat farmer you know, letting some land grow fallow, go fallow and maybe some grazing it than you would somebody who only does livestock deciding, now I think I'm gonna grow me some wheat because mm -hmm. they'd probably have to buy a lot more equipment and it'd be more of a hurdle, but I could be wrong. Fair I'm, Fair I'm not a farmer. So there's a lot of kind of common understanding, yeah. which can be, you know, vastly wrong, <laughs> that a kind of a meat-free diet is better for the, for, for, for the, for the ecosystem, for the, for, the, for the planet in general. Mm. There's a little bit of conversation about that, but yeah. is, it, is it really? Because, you know, don't you need to have some animals walking around as part of the biodiversity of the, of, of the, the, the ecosystem that you're, that you're growing food on? Would you like, uh, like to comment a bit on that? Or? Yeah, I think that it kind of goes back to what we were saying about the scale. Um, there's nothing wrong with animals per se. There is something wrong with the way that we are farming them in such numbers and concentrations that, I mean, the land can't handle their poop. It's just this too much stuff in one area, too much nutrients, as they would say. And, you know, it, it's just, it washes off into the rivers because the land can't absorb it. And so it's the way we demand scale that means concentration that means pollution, really, that's one of the biggest problems. And let's face it, there's just too many of us to be farming animals in this way for all of us to eat them all the time and it be okay. It's just, it's just biology. All right, gonna go a little wonky for a moment. Oh, oh, I love wonk. Um, wonk away. <laughs> so in, how do you see us best kind of dealing with nitrogen? Like, for example, there's been a little bit of kind of playing around in New Zealand with uh, kind of mm. cap and trade system. And maybe, like, is there is there a case to be made for uh, kind of a nitrogen emissions trading system? I think there definitely is. Mm. Um, I think that... In my understanding, cap and trade systems have historically worked quite well. Although you can't call them cap and trade, but yes. No, yeah, yeah. yeah. What, don't use the tax word. Don't use like it's. it's we have you, to. We have to, that, yeah. that, that system that shall not be named. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Take, take the, the, the Canadians' um, advice in all of this is to say this is this is a charge on pollution. It is definitely not a tax. It's a charge on pollution. Charge on pol polluter pays <laughs> kind of thing. Um, well, I, I think that if you can incentivize it in a way that you know makes farmers even more conscious of what they're using, what they're losing, and makes them want to figure out all the ways that they can get by with less and have similar yield, it's a fantastic thing because it gives them a, a moving goalpost to ratchet down in a way that hopefully can actually support them in that ratcheting down. And this is a point I definitely want to make because it's one thing to say polluter pays, but I think it, we need to have sticks, guidelines, goalposts, and carrots, rewards for improvement, because we need to support these farmers in this drawdown. Our system that we have all created has put these incentives in place that have them doing what they're doing. If we're going to change things, change the goalposts, we need to have the, the support mechanisms for them as they learn new ways of, of doing things. I was calling agriculture an outdoor experiment, it is, if you think about it, the farmer can't control the weather, increasingly can't predict the weather because it's crazy, <laughs> right? The only thing that they can control is what they're trying to grow and what inputs they use. And so those are the levers that they push on because that's all they've really got. And so if we're going to ask them to use less of those inputs, their lever of control, then we need to be there to help support them if they have a bad year as they're learning and as they're figuring it out and rehabilitating their soil. Because we depend on them, whether we realize it or not. Mm. So we need to support them in that. Yeah, interesting. And, but for that type of 
Okay, major, like the, the amount of time and energy it has taken to get anything resembling <laughs> functioning carbon markets, and we're still, and we're still very, there's very, very few and far between. Yeah. For that type of kind of change in um, in you know society's understanding of the of the element, we'd need um, for kind of like at least kind of financial sector, insurance, uh, insurance sectors, like the, the big part, big other parts of the, the community, not just agriculture, to be saying this is this is important. Mm -hmm. um, how do you make the case mm -hmm. that that there's, like we kind of touched on it before, that it's important to other parts of, yeah. the, of, of the economy? Well, as we were saying, you know, the water companies have a cost, the uh, banks and the food companies have compliance issues. Um, we didn't talk about food companies, but they're trying to decrease their scope three. And nitrogen fertilizer is the source of about two thirds of the carbon footprint of most crops grown. So it's a huge part of that carbon footprint of the, the food. So if the food companies can put in support mechanisms to help the farmer draw down on their nitrogen reliance, that helps their case. So I think it's, it's kind of like it takes the village Every farm has these three potential supporters to help them in this journey. And what we want to do with Agreed is we want to be the MRV for N, so to speak, the monitoring, reporting, and verification of that farmer's improvement in their nitrogen use efficiency, reducing their loss, reducing their use, so that that value is quantified and captured and then paid back to the farmer to really incentivize, but also reduce that risk once they've been able to draw down on their need for all of those inputs and their soil biology is functioning beautifully again, the soil is able to hold moisture when it rains and is able to get through a drought better when it doesn't rain so much, then that farmer's overheads should be reduced. And so their profitability should be much more resilient. Um, so it's really about helping them through that transition to get them to that point of more financial resilience. So it's not a forever thing. It's a transition play. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I understand that you've had a kind of you know, pr pretty pretty big success story yesterday. Can you tell us about it? Oh yeah, yeah. Yesterday, for the first time ever, hot off the presses, we demoed our farmer-facing tool to farmers with the customer that we're working with, and it was amazing. I was you know kind of biting my nails, going, "What's he going to say? Is he going to like it?" And what we heard, you know, there's definitely we're just getting started. Lots of room for improvement and what was very heartening to hear was that we were speaking his language because we were talking about costs of production and we were talking about loss of you know, income, loss of um, the money that he'd already paid that was just going out the door, well, down the river, so to speak, and, and him being able to see that and immediately start thinking of things that he could do differently to reduce that was um, very heartening. Thank you. Well, as we are coming to an end, <laughs> what we normally do is ask for a little piece of advice from, um, from, from our guests. And in your case, uh, would you mind uh, giving a little bit of advice on what helps you shake up your perspective? Like if there's what one action would you recommend to our listeners um, that would shake up their perspective on climate and food? Uh, be a three-year-old. Ask why. <laughs> I'm, I'm serious, like, like, dare to think different, you know? It, it, it's just like, I'm an easily frustrated person, and what I found is that that can come in handy because I'm like, why is it this way? It shouldn't be this way! And I start thinking of all the different ways it could be. And I think that that's one of the greatest tools that we can do is harness our own frustration because it can lead to solutions to make things better. I think I've said the same thing many, many times. I think it's, 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 it is a necessary trait for an entrepreneur and, uh, well. We're, we are all entrepreneurs at heart because <laughs> we're all easily frustrated with various things in life. So just fix it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks so much for your time. It's been brilliant. Good, cool. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us on that conversation. We hope that you enjoyed it. We hope that you uh, learned something. If you did enjoy it, please feel free to leave a five-star review and to subscribe to any of our channels and we'll be sure to keep you updated on future productions. These are conversations that you just can't afford to miss.